from Hot Mess to Favorite Cut with Kathy. Kathy is an organizer of uh, WordCamp Atlanta, and she's also on the organizing team for WordCamp US. Um, and the only way we were able to actually get her to come today was to promise her cheese and sweet tea, which you noticed we had at lunch. So, y'all welcome Kathy. Thank you. Imagine, it's 10.15, Thursday morning, you're seated at your desk, phone in hand, headsets on, you're ready to call Phyllis at 10.30. Phyllis reached out to you on Monday afternoon using the contact form on your website. In her message, she said she was looking for someone to build a simple website. Would you be available to call me at 10.30 Thursday morning? Yes, you agreed. There are two people involved in the conversation that are about to happen. Each of you with similar emotions, thoughts, concerns, an emotional roller coaster, if you will. You, as you're sitting there waiting to make the phone call, are saying, Please let her buy a big website. Please let it not be a $500 information site. I have a car sitting in my garage that needs $1,000 worth of work. The dishwasher is leaking. Please, please. Let her buy a big website. We call this hope. A few minutes later, in your head, or maybe you're talking to your cat, please, please don't let this be a train wreck. Please, please don't let it be a train wreck. Please don't let it be a train wreck. We call this emotion fear. Hope and fear at the same time are on opposite spectrums of an emotional scale. We call that a hot mess. At the same time, Phyllis is waiting for your phone call. Oh Lord, please let this work. Please let them know what to do. Please, please, please make this work. We call this emotion hope. I'm supposed to go back this way. Hope. A few minutes later, she's praying. Please don't let me sound stupid. Please don't let them sell me something I can't afford. Please, dear God, help me. Help me. I want this to work. We call this emotion. Fear. <coughs> same, same, right? Just like you, a mixture of emotions that lead to a hot mess. You're afraid. No, you're not afraid, Jim. Yeah. Let me get my notes in front of me. You hope that they are a cool person who just came into an appearance or maybe some alimony, 
or the lottery, whatever. You're afraid that they're batshit crazy and bankrupt. Phyllis, like you, same, same, mixed emotions, opposite side of the same mirror, hopes that you can solve the problem. Ideally for a price that you can that they can afford. Her fear is that you can't do it. We've seen that cat too many many times. What if there was a better way to handle this hot mess? I believe that there is, and I believe that it can happen at 10.30 this morning when you get on the phone to chat with Phyllis. And that's what we're going to explore today. You're nervous. They're nervous. What happens when your prospect gets nervous? They're afraid that you're going to think they're stupid. They're afraid that you're going to think that they are an idiot. They're afraid that you are going to gouge them and take advantage of them in some way. And they're afraid that the conversation that is about to happen is going to be a very, very awkward um, conversation. So what do they do? They put on a happy face. And they pretend like they know a lot about technology. They have researched this. They know exactly what the problem is and how they want you to tackle it. Or, on the reverse, they'll pretend like they don't know anything and that they're worse than they truly are. So someone has to take control of this conversation and stop this weirdness of hot mess to hot mess trying to come to some middle ground. If we talk about this as a hope, fear, tension, the responsibility for resolving that is on your shoulders. After all, you're the one who's being paid for this consultation and for the prospective work. So you have to take control and run the meeting as if you were a consultant. Does that make sense? One of the things that I want you to remember is that when people tell you something is wrong or doesn't work for them, they're almost always right. Think about that. When people tell you something's wrong or doesn't work for them, they are almost always right. When they tell you exactly what they think is wrong and how to fix it, they are almost always wrong. Does that sound familiar? Where, how many of you were in Ben's presentation on support, giving support? He used some great analogies in there um, that I won't repeat, but you as a consultant have to take charge. And part of what taking charge is it's knowing that it is not their job to tell you how to fix what's happening. So let's talk a little bit about the reasons why you should be act as a consultant. Reason number one, you're basically already a consultant. So start acting like one. The problem that I've encountered is that most freelancers see themselves as being hired by a prospective client for a specific set of skills. I don't agree. I think you're being hired for your expertise. Reason number two to act like a consultant is so that you can charge like one. There's a different mindset that goes with this. People who tend to see themselves uh, as a person with a skill as 
opposed to uh, expertise, the value expertise, end up charging for the skill. Does that make sense? Anyone who takes consulting seriously can tell you that when they made this shift in mindset, they made more money than they did prior to that. Reason number three to assume the role of consultant, your time is a limited resource. Your brain is expensive. Consultants differentiate their pricing based on the roles that they perform. If you'll think with me about the tasks that you will do on a daily basis. Some of those tasks have to do with hand knowledge. I can go in, edit CSS, and scoop this over here, for example. Maybe it's a quick little fix. There are other pieces of our daily work that requires more head knowledge. As someone said to me earlier this week, I've been asked to execute this outcome and I don't know yet how to wrap my head around the approach. That's going to cost you more, you being the user, the prospective client, it's going to cost more to purchase that head information than it is to go edit a few pixels in CSS. There's also collaborative dialogue between you and Phyllis in this 1030 conversation. Part of your role is to determine in that very first phone call not so much what it is they want done, you know, we're skipping straight into scoping out the project. Your first piece and this, or your first action in the, in the first contact is to initiate the conversation that we are in this together. Together, we're going to collaborate and achieve the outcome that you're, you know, you're talking about achieving. Okay. Reason number five into why we should act as a consultant as opposed to somebody who just knows how to build websites is because the mind shift that we take or that happens when we begin to think of ourselves as the CEO of our business is vastly different than we think of ourselves as a freelancer who knows how to do certain does that make sense? Have you ever had a client who keeps asking to get on the phone with you? Anybody? No. You know, they send you an email, can you give me a call? Can you give me a call? What about this? What about that? As soon as someone starts asking you those questions, you have already stepped into a consultancy role in their mind. They are treating you as a consultant. So we go back to step reason one, act like a consultant. Reason number six is if I value myself as a consultant, an authority, an expert, someone full of confidence and know-how, other people will assume that same expectation of us. They will value us as a consultant. People who don't value themselves, their work, or their expertise don't charge enough. It's hard for them to close a deal or get taken for a ride. Surely I am not the only consultant in the room who has fallen prey to a passive-aggressive never-ending scope project because I did not take control of the situation. So it's 1030 and you're getting ready to call. You've made it to a level of consultant. Part of what this does for Phyllis when she gets on the phone is that you are relieving her 
of the responsibility of self-diagnosis. Yes, you are going to ask some questions about what she has in mind. Maybe a little bit, probing a little bit of what's her definition of simple website? What does that mean to her? But your task in this first contact is to sell her, if you will, convince her, assure her that yes, there is hope. You can do what she wants to. When we burden someone with the responsibility of self-diagnosis, we're asking more of them than is capable. So if you think about it a different way, if I went to my doctor and said, you know, about 3 o'clock every afternoon, I get in a physical slump. I'm tired. I just feel like I want to lay down and take a nap. I've done some research. I've looked on Google. I think I have a thyroid deficiency. And what I think you ought to do is prescribe this and give me some B12 shots. That's self-diagnosis. We as humans would not presume to do that in most interactions with our physician. And yet too often as a freelancer, we allow the prospective client to self-diagnose and that's too much work for them. There is no hope um, that's instilled with their doing self-diagnosis. Remember, Phyllis is on the phone hoping that you can take care of this. And if I allow her to explain, I've done this and I think it's that, then we've done her a disservice. We've made her responsible for the answers. And that's not fair. That's not very adult, grown up, and it's certainly not insult on the mind. In his landmark bestseller, Full <coughs> Consulting, Peter Block talks about five phases of consulting. Today we're only take, talk, talking about the first phase, and that is entry and contracting. When I first got started in WordPress quote development, and I put development in quotes because I'm not a coder, I had some presumptions that my first contact was to be all about discovery. How many of you think that your first responsibility in that first contact is discovery and defining the scope? No. That first contact is about establishing rapport and instilling a sense of confidence. The second phase is about discovery. So what I do when people reach out to me in that first contact is I ask them, tell me what hurts. One of the things that asking this question does in the conversation is that it cuts through the BS, that posturing that they do because they're frightened. And it cuts right to the, cuts to the chase. Tell me what hurts. And they do. I've tried to say things like, tell me what's the problem, and it does not get the same results. Tell me what hurts. When you go into a physician's office, for most of us, because we speak English natively, we're not asked to use the little chart that's on the wall, where it's on a scale of 1 to 10, what spidey things are you. But that's part of what you're doing here in this conversation. Tell me what hurts. We want to ask that question in a confident, assertive voice as opposed to that therapist, let me speak to your inner child voice. No. Tell me what hurts. No. Tell me what hurts, which is our way of asking what's wrong, what's the problem. 
And then we want to say, I'll take care of it. They don't have to figure it all out on their own. What hurts is the core question in the beginning. What is causing you pain? People are motivated by only one of two things, avoiding pain or seeking pleasure. And to uncover their frustrations, concerns, and challenges, you need to ask good questions. Use curiosity. Ask what prompted your reaching out to me? What made you want to do this now versus later? What made you curious about investing the time and energy to talk with me today? Because they are investing time and energy. You're acknowledging that they're feeling nervous and anxious as they begin to explain the situation. You also want to ask, assuming that we work together and when it comes to making financial arrangements, are you the decision maker? <coughs> Poke around that a little bit. Are you ready to talk about money? Is it okay if we talk about money? What were you envisioning paying for this? I try not to use the word budget because budget is a scary word, and I say that to them. I'm not going to use the word budget. Budget is a scary word. But I'd like to ask, what were you envisioning paying for this? And they will tell you they do have some number in mind. So you want to explore that some. Well, looking at my notes again. As I ad lib and talk a whole lot faster than I planned. Okay, we did that, we did that, we talked about that. So, assuming that they've asked, answered these questions that you've posed, what next? How do you close? People ask me all the time, so how, how can I close the deal when I haven't scoped the project yet? And it comes back to what deal is it that you are trying to close in this first conversation? And it's not quoting a website. In the conversation, I have determined a few tidbits, perhaps some things that I could address while we're in the conversation. I'm struggling with this. What about that? Maybe you can say, well, right offhand, I can see that what you were describing to me, we're going to need to focus in on your target market. Yeah. Again, we're coming back to instilling some hope. So I asked them, if I come where I can see it, um, as I begin to close it out, is after our conversation today, do you think that my team and I can handle what we've been talking about? Do you believe that we can get the job done? Do you think that we can move forward? Are you ready to move forward today with a project agreement? Not a financial quote, but a project agreement. Or do you need some time to think about it? If they have gained a sense of confidence, they will be prepared to say, yes, I'm ready to keep moving, but I need to know what it's going to cost. 
and you remind them again, you bring them back to the conversation that that's not the goal of today. What I want to know is, have I established a sense of trust? Maybe not using those exact words, but that's our goal. Do you think our team can get the job done? If so, my assistant will send you um, a project agreement for you to look over, and then we could move forward with a quote. If not, is it okay if we follow up with it? And I have talked really, really fast, and we're going to open this up for questions instead, or at this point, and we'll talk 10 times over. What kinds of things come to mind when you think about that first contact with a prospective client? Are you thinking about establishing rapport, or are you thinking about finding out what they want? Are you in the discovery process?
So Mickey says that he thinks the first contact should be based on relationship. So can you talk more about how you develop a relationship? Yeah, I mean, I'm just real with people. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and throw you for a buck if I can't do what you need. Then I'm going to tell you I can't do what you need. Um, a lot of people, the hardest part of anybody in the web design industry is essentially showing up to the job interview at first, trying to get the job. Um, think about how many web developers are here out there that will actually do an appointment and they'll, they'll show up. So, Show when you're going to show up. Be real with people. Uh, build that relationship and um, be true to yourself. And don't promise something you can't deliver. So, okay. That's just and the way I do business. As Mickey explores that further, he talks about one of the ways that he instills trust is that he shows up when he says he's going to show up. He does what he said he's going to do. And no BS. Be upfront, honest, and authentic. If it sounds like something you can't fulfill, then don't say sure. sure. Other thoughts from anybody? Doug? How much pre-qualification would you do if, for example, my budget is $25,000, but I called your agency and you don't really start it until $250,000, how, how far into this relationship conversation should we get? Good question. Doug uh, raises the point of pre-qualification. If me as a client have a budget of $2,500 and you as a developer don't build sites for anything less than $250, where do we go? Um, I would simply say that every client's not a client. So, you know, uh, I'm not afraid of this one. Okay. I guess my question is, do you find that out during the interview, or are there... Well, the first thing, I mean, everybody can relate to this if you're in the web industry. The first thing that gives it to the customer's mouth is, how much does this one cost? So to be up front and say, hey, I don't do any websites less than this, don't waste your time. And I mean, if they say, okay, well, I don't have that, just say, hey, there's other sources out there that you can go use and utilize, then this is what I value my time at. Just be walking straight up. I mean, literally, that's the way that I've grown my way to see it. It's worked for me. Uh, yeah, but imagine that. that I'm buying a vehicle and uh, I haven't worked out all the goals yet. So I go to the motorcycle dealership and they're like, oh, yeah, you could buy this motorcycle for $5,000 cash right now and walk out of the store with it. But I started really evaluating my priorities and it turns out I need a $50,000 or $100,000 motorhome because I want to tour the country and I want to save money on hotel rooms. So, but I, I filled out the form that said I don't want to spend more than five thousand dollars. It turned out I didn't know as a client that I actually really need the hundred thousand dollar vehicle. Like where do we find that balance? Do I have to have this conversation? Well, it, it's, it's, or, your, it's your job to educate your customer. That's what we're here for. We're here to educate Let's let's dial it back a little bit. One one is because none of that's getting reported. From, for the video. Um, so to, to kind of dovetail that, what we have happening in the room is a conversation about budget in our very first contact. I like to start with what hurts, what is causing you pain, and then you begin to discover some of the parameters of the project. My biggest problem is I and on the speaker circuit, and I need a website that gives my bio, and I don't have one. And our approach and guidance to that would be di very different than someone who says, I am an artist, and I create beautiful work, and no one knows but me. I need to have a simple website putting simple website in quotes. I want a simple website that I can sell my art. And then it begins to give you another perspective. And so those first questions are around what hurts? What is causing you pain? I don't want them to think about the answer that they think they need. 
they have reached out because they think they need a website. That may or may not be true. Okay? So I need to discover their pain point first so that I can respond with, I can understand. I know that how that would be frustrating. That sounds like a worthwhile endeavor. I believe we can help you with that. And then it's moving into budget is a scary word. Let's talk about that differently. What were you thinking of paying for this? What were you thinking of a simple information site that would help be a press release versus what were you thinking of paying for a site that would help me sell my artwork? Two totally different conversations. And I think the point of that first in interview, if you will, using Diane's analogy, is I am in charge of the conversation. I need to discover where the pain is. I, and part of that process is also assuring them that what they are asking is not unrealistic. It may be inappropriate for my agency to take on that project, but I know lots of other people in the community who are capable of taking that on. Would it be okay if I referred you to them, for example? My first job is to tell them they're not stupid for asking what they're asking for, what they want may be unrealistic, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. I get an awful lot of emails from people who have said, I have a website, and I don't know how to use it. I had this person build it for me, and that person is no longer available. So then I went to this person over here, and for whatever reason, that's not working. You are the third person I have talked to. It is not within me to not be helpful and affirming in that conversation. Asking, affirming their point of view. What hurts? How can we make that better? And what were you thinking of paying for the solution? Other general comments? We're done.